Good morning, everyone. I believe that God is a good God. Amen. Even we are not in the good condition, but we still believe that God is a good God. Let's prepare our heart to worship together. Set our heart upon Him. Hallelujah. my 
strength, my shield To you alone May my spirit be You alone are my heart Desire and alone To worship Thee strength, my shield, to you alone.
adore you glorify thy name in all the earth glorify thy name Thy name. 
Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Alpha Omega International. Thank you for joining us once again for our portraits series. As you know, we've, we've been going over this series for several weeks now. In fact, today is part 11 uh, in this series. So uh, it's been very enjoyable for me to teach this and also to hear about the conversations in our connect groups that are going on concerning uh, the messages from portraits. Uh, it's been truly a, a blessing uh, in, in seeing what the Lord has done for so many people just like you and me. So let's pick up today in the Gospel of Mark. We're going to consider a sermon titled, The Other Side. And we're going to read a story that begins in chapter 4 of Mark and then continues into chapter 5. The man that we're going to meet today in the story is called a Gadarene, the Gadarene. He's from Gadara from the other side of the Sea of Galilee. This is the man that was filled with at least 2,000 demons, horribly possessed by them. And Jesus healed him. So let's see what happens in this story. We're going to read uh, most of chapter five eventually, but we're only gonna do it in portions, not in the very beginning. So as we go throughout the sermon, we'll, we'll uh, focus back in on reading some more verses from the story. So let's begin chapter four. Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 35, and again, the sermon is titled, The Other Side. Verse 35, on the same day, when evening had come, he, that is Jesus, said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, 
they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? And then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. All right. In today's sermon, coming from Mark chapter 4, this is still early in the Gospel of Mark. And we've read in the first few chapters of Jesus' uh, ministry throughout all the villages, along with his disciples. And the disciples are enjoying uh, quite a, a local and successful ministry. They've been in the area of Galilee, where most of them are from. They have spent a lot of time in a city called Capernaum. And so in Galilee, in Capernaum, it's all very familiar to them. They know these villages. They know these cities. They know many of the people. They all speak the same dialect. Familiar places, familiar people. And they probably felt a lot like you and I would feel in that situation. We would feel comfortable. We feel like these are people just like us. We're all from the same area, the same place. Maybe most of us have the same interests in life. And so ministering to the people that we know, well, that, that would be quite familiar comfortable to us. But in this story, it was time for Jesus to give sort of a, a gentle nudge to his disciples. It was time to bring the gospel beyond familiar and to bring the gospel to a place that the disciples would probably rather not go, to a people that they would probably rather not see. It was the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And as we consider the story today uh, about the Gadarene, we're going to look at it not through that man's eyes. Instead, we're going to see the story through the eyes of the disciples. What did they see? What did they understand in all of this? And as we do that, we're going to look at three facts of the story in our outline. So we're going to talk about, number one, where they went. Number two, with whom they went. And number three, why they went. So let's begin with number one, where they went. Again, in verse 35 of chapter 4, Jesus said, Let us cross over to the other side. Now, of course, he's talking about the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But the other side was much more than that. There's much more about the other side than just the location of the disciples going from one side to the other. What he's talking about, the other side, is a region called the Decapolis. In the Greek, it means 10 cities. And it's believed that the people that lived on the other side, in the Decapolis region, they were the leftover Canaanite nations. The same seven nations that you read about in the Old Testament that Joshua and the Israelites were to drive out of the land. Well, many of the remnants of, that, of those nations were now in the Decapolis, and they, they, they grew, they, they multiplied, they prospered in that land. And so many believe that the people of the Decapolis were Canaanite nations, but there's also a mixed multitude of Greek people who have come into the Decapolis. And with that, you not only have a a mixed multitude of people, Canaanites and Greeks, but you also have a, a mixed culture uh, and an education that was a Greek-emphasized education. And so the Greeks came and they built uh, theaters. They were to build gymnasiums where, where learning would happen and academics and athletics would, would take place. Much of the influence of the Greeks was in the Decapolis. And of course, 
There was a now a, a mixed religion as well, a pagan religion. You had the gods of the Canaanites, and now you had the gods of the Greeks mixed together. And all the people have their different forms of worship. They built many demonic sanctuaries and temples in Decapolis. In fact, later on in the years to come, they would build what is now famously called the Temple of Zeus. The ruins are still there in this area of Jordan as it is today. But the Decapolis, the other side of the Sea of Galilee, it was a place of evil. There were evil people doing evil things. In their worship, the Canaanites worship the gods of Baal. The Greeks worship their own gods, namely Zeus. And in this worship, in these two cultures of worship, the Canaanites would worship by bringing their children and sacrificing them in honor of their gods. The Greeks, they added all kinds of sexual perversions into their worship. So there was a lot of sexual activity and prostitution in the temples and around the temples of the Decapolis. We also read in the story that there were evidently a lot of pigs in this area, at least 2,000 that we're going to read about in our story. Why are there so many pigs there? Well, it's believed that these pigs, they were used as sacrifice to the gods. Now that might be true because in the worship of Zeus, they did sacrifice pigs. In fact, we read in history of a Greek named uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, who came into Jerusalem, persecuted and slaughtered so many Jews, and then he set up an altar to Zeus right there at the temple, and he began to slaughter pigs, sacrificing pigs upon the altar. It was an abomination to that temple in Jerusalem. So it is very likely that these pigs, they're used for sacrifice. Pigs also were, there was a symbol about them. In the, in the Roman culture, in the, the Roman legions, the soldiers of Rome, in fact, there was a legion stationed in the Decapolis. They would use the head of a pig or a boar. They would use that symbol upon their breastplate as a, as a symbol of strength. And so it's possible that these, these pigs had this sort of uh, symbolism to the Decapolis people. They, it was used as a form of worship. Whatever the case was, pigs were an absolute disgrace to the Jew. They wanted nothing to do with pigs. You remember the story that Jesus told of the prodigal son. And Jesus says that this son, he took his inheritance and he wanted to just live however he wanted to, by his own pleasures. And Jesus said in the story that the son went to a far away country. There are many that believe that this, the place that Jesus had in mind was the Decapolis. Because this son would go to a place like that, waste his money on so many horrible, sinful things. And then what was he left with? He was in the mud with pigs eating their food. So it's possible Jesus was talking about the Decapolis, the other side. But this was a part of the Greek influence in that area. It was all about living according to your pleasures, satisfying your own lusts and appetites. And that's what we find on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. God-fearing Jews wanted nothing to do with the Decapolis. It was the land of Satan, and it was against everything that the Jews believed. It was on the other side, and the Jews wanted it to stay that way. So you can probably imagine what the disciples thought when Jesus suddenly says to them, let us cross over to the other side. What? How can this be? Is he serious? Is he not aware of what happens over there? Does Jesus not know the kinds of people live that, that, that live there and the things that they do? Why not stay here? where it's familiar and comfortable. You're accepted here, Jesus. You seem to be popular here in Galilee, especially in Capernaum. Why not just enjoy the, the popularity here and the safety here in our own home? 
And if the other side wasn't already bad enough, the way to the other side was to cross over the deep sea of Galilee. Now to the Israelites, especially to fishermen, they were not fans of the deep waters of the Sea of Galilee. They would rather stay in the shallow part. They even fished in the shallow areas, but not in the depths of that sea. The Sea of Galilee, some of the farthest depths of that place today, reaches 200 feet or more down. That's a very deep sea. And you can imagine, as the disciples are considering having to go over that deep sea, they look at that as the great abyss. In fact, when Luke tells the story, this same story, he calls the Sea of Galilee the abyss. It was deep waters. And they didn't like the thought of crossing over deep waters. To them, it was the abyss out of which all the dynamic, uh, 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 demonic powers arose. They remembered the story of Leviathan that Job talked about, this monstrous beast that lived in the depths of the waters. They also remember about Daniel talking about these monsters that arose out of the, the sea, out of the waters. And also, they knew that Baal was a storm god. And you see that in this story, there's a storm that comes upon them while they're trying to cross over these deep waters. And so maybe in the disciples' mind, it was like all the demonic force and power of the world was against them. There will be times when God will send you to a place that you thought you would never go. And He may send you to a people you thought you would never speak to. When I recall how the Lord sent me to Indonesia, before the Lord called me here back in the year 2000, I had no thoughts of going to Indonesia. I had no thoughts about ministering here in this place. It was never a part of my plan or my future. But the Lord called me. The Lord had a purpose and a plan for me. He brought me here. And the Lord will do that. Your other side doesn't necessarily have to be a faraway country as perhaps it was for me. For you, the other side can be that place you just don't feel comfortable being in, being in, or, or those people that you don't feel comfortable talking to. The other side for you can be your own family. Family members that you have that don't believe like you believe. Maybe they worship another God. Maybe they, they, they're a part of a different religion, or maybe they have no religion at all. Have you ever tried to talk to them? It's difficult, isn't it? It's the other side. It's a difficult thing to do. It's difficult to approach people that we've known for so long, people who we have loved for so long. There's something about that relationship that makes it difficult. There's a fear that creeps into our heart in sharing the gospel with them. Or maybe it's friends that you've had for a very long time. But now that you've become a Christian, they have not. It's difficult sometimes to go back to those people that you grew up with, that you shared so many things in life with, and now to share the gospel with them, it becomes a challenge. Our city, and wherever you're from, your city is filled with people from the other side. Normally, it's the people that you stay away from. But how will they ever know? about Jesus? How will they ever know the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? How will they ever know Him unless somebody tells them? Someone has to go. Someone has to be courageous enough. We have to realize that our church is not a building of four walls and we just meet inside this building and we only keep to ourselves. No. It's made with people, people who are to go out into the communities, go out into the world and bring the good news of Jesus to others. Yes, we need to minister to one another, but we also must go out and find the lost. 
partner with the Holy Spirit and through His guidance and through His power, continue the ministry of Jesus, seeking and saving that which was lost. Because if we don't do it, who will? Many years ago, we had a neighbor living right next door to us. And it just seemed like we could not get along with this neighbor. There were arguments over the property line, arguments about what my family did in our backyard. And, and he just always had a problem with the things that we did. And, and no matter what we did, as far as reaching out an olive branch of peace to him, I guess he took it the wrong way. Maybe he was just a hard man and he just did not ever uh, come to a, a good place with us. He, he never really liked us very much. And so I think for many of us in my family, we sort of just wrote him off as, as a hopeless individual. There's just nothing we can do. He's hopeless. And so we just tried to learn to ignore him and, and not pay any attention to him. But as the years went by, he got sick. And my father decided to go to the other side, literally to the other side of the property, to this man, our neighbor. And when he was sick, my father visited him, encouraged him, prayed for him, and told him about the love of Jesus Christ. And eventually this neighbor, hard as he was, he received Jesus Christ as his savior. What would have happened if my father never went to the other side? This man died not too long afterward, and maybe if he had died without anybody ever going to talk to him, he wouldn't be with Jesus today. Where did the disciples go? To the other side. Number two, with whom? With whom did they go? The Bible says once again, listen to what Jesus said, let us cross over to the other side. You hear that? Let us. Jesus is a part of that group called us. Let us cross over to the other side. They were not alone. Jesus was with them. He was with them just as he promised to be with us. When he said, go therefore and preach this gospel, make disciples of all the nations. And lo, I am with you always even until the end of the age. He was with them as he is always with us wherever we go. And on the way to the other side, the Bible says that there was a great storm. To me, it's a real possibility that this storm represented all the demonic forces that were on the other side that knew Jesus and the disciples were coming. This storm represented the demonic forces trying to keep them away from the Decapolis. It wasn't the disciples the demons were worried about. It was the one who was with the disciples in that boat. It was Jesus. The enemy attempted to strike fear in the disciples, and they were afraid. And perhaps the, the demonic forces were hoping that the, the disciples would be so afraid that they would just turn the boat around and go back home. Or, or Jesus would see such a lack of faith in them that he would know that this mission is hopeless. And so, turn around, go back home. But instead, the Son of God, who spoke the worlds into existence, Mark says he spoke into that storm. He spoke to the sea. And he said, Peace, be still. And immediately, there was a great calm in the sea. There was a great calm, no more storm. And every demonic power from those words of Jesus, every demon was subdued. They submitted to the authority of Jesus. He said to the disciples, why are you so fearful? Don't you know, as I said in the beginning, let us cross over to the other side. As it was in the beginning, so it is right now. It's still us. I'm still with you. Even though this storm has come against you, even though perhaps all the demonic forces from the other side that know we're coming, even though they might come against you, 
I am with you. Just as it was in the beginning, so it is now, and so it shall ever be. Jesus was with them. And let's pick up the story in chapter 5. Verse 1, it says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he, that is Jesus, came out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, day and night, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Now, if the thoughts of going to the other side were already striking fear in the disciples' heart, what do you suppose is in their minds now? Seeing this demon-possessed man running to Jesus and speaking the way that he is, what do they think now? This man, he lived among the tombs. No one could bind him. Even with chains that they tied around him or, or shackles that they put him in, he broke them. He, he pulled them apart. He, he busted them into pieces. But though he could free himself from whatever chains man put on him, he couldn't free himself from the chains that the demons had upon his life. Mark says no one could tame him. Tame. That's a word we use for animals, taming animals. It's as though he is some kind of animal. And day and night, he screams and he cuts himself with stones, just like the worshipers of Baal did in the Old Testament when they met with Elijah on Mount Carmel. In their worship and in their crying out to their god Baal, they began to cut their arms and cut them, their bodies open and they were bleeding everywhere. Here is the ugliest, most grotesque human being the disciples had ever seen. In fact, he was hardly human. The disciples must have thought this was Satan in the flesh. And remember, he knew, think of this, he knew Jesus was coming. He knew that the storm had been sent out against them. But he knew that the storm was broken by the Son of God. He knew, and I believe every demon inside of him knew, Jesus is coming. And when he set foot on that land, on the other side, this man went running to Jesus and worshipped him. They didn't worship, these demons didn't worship out of adoration. They worshipped because they knew who Jesus was. The Son of the Most High God. And so the demon cried out, what do you want to do with me? What do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Are you here to torment me? He didn't bow to the disciples. He bowed to Jesus. The demons knew that their time was up and they were begging Jesus for mercy. Jesus asked what his name was and the voice that came out said, Legion, for we are many. Legion, that's a, a Latin word to describe a band or a company of Roman soldiers, the Roman legionnaires. And a legion could be as many as just over 6,000 soldiers. How many demons are inside of this man? Well, we're going to read that 2,000 pigs were filled with demons, but that doesn't mean more than one demon couldn't fill a pig. Evidently, more than one demon is filling this man. There could be 2,000, 3,000, even 6,000 demons in this one man. What a horrible, hopeless condition he is in. They were called legion, for there were many of them. Jesus cast out these demons, 
every single one of them. Not one was left. And as a result, they filled about 2,000 pigs. The pigs went crazy, ran down the mountain, ran into the abyss, into the Sea of Galilee, and there they drowned. And those pigs, perhaps used for worship, were now gone forever. Look at Mark chapter 5, verse 14. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him, who had been demon-possessed, and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him, that's Jesus, to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. What a beautiful picture. Again, if we were to take a snapshot of this picture, here it is right here. Here is the beautiful portrait. This once totally insane, ugly, naked, screaming man is now healed, sitting, he's clothed, and he's in his right mind again. What a powerful healing and deliverance Jesus just gave to this man. You know, only Jesus could have done something like this. Only Jesus could have taken such a broken man like this and turned him into something brand new. And what a wonderful uh, contrast we have. It's only been a matter of a few minutes. I mean, just a few minutes ago, this man, as crazy as he was and, and controlled and, and possessed by demons, just a few minutes later, he's completely brand new again. And what, what a wonderful contrast between the old and the new. Only Jesus can do that. And I'm sure that if you were to consider your life in the past, maybe 20 years ago or 10 years ago, if you were to take a snapshot of, of your life back then and then take a snapshot of you today and put them side by side, I hope you would see a huge difference. But I also hope you understand and realize that that difference, only Jesus could have done that. Only Jesus could have taken this brokenness, this sinfulness, this complete helplessness and loss in this world and turn it into a brand new creation, alive in Christ Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Only Jesus can do something like this. Only Jesus could have changed this man in our story. And only Jesus could have done the change that has happened in us. Amen. This story shows that no one, no one is beyond the reach of Christ. Nobody is so bad that they cannot be changed and saved by Jesus. No one is beyond His reach. No one is beyond His love. Now in the story, when the people of Decapolis saw what happened to this man, they begged Jesus to leave. They wanted Him out of the Decapolis. The light of truth had just invaded their world, and they were terrified of it. And so Jesus, without an argument, simply got back into the boat. But there was one Decapolis resident who didn't want him to go. There was one who didn't want to be apart from Jesus. And that was the man of our story, the man who was demon-possessed. The man that Jesus healed, all he wanted was to go wherever Jesus was going. And he didn't know where Jesus was going. He didn't know what city he would go to, what, what people he would go to. All the man knew was, Wherever you go, I want to be there. Surely, this man would have made a great disciple. Surely, Jesus could have said, you know what? Instead of 12, let's make it 13. And let's add this, this new convert. 
I'm sure he made a, would, have, would have made a great disciple, but Jesus, Jesus refused to let him go. Jesus very strongly did not permit him to get into the boat and to go with them. Why? Because saving this man was only the beginning of what Jesus would eventually do for all of Decapolis. For now, there was something that this man needed to do. There was something important that he needed to do and Jesus was about to send him on a mission. So number one in our story, we've seen where they went, the Decapolis, the other side. Number two, we saw with whom they went, that is Jesus. Now number three, why they went. Verse 19, here's what Jesus says to him. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Wow. What Jesus is telling him to do may seem like the most difficult mission possible. He's telling him, go back now into the Decapolis. Go back into this world of pagan worship and of all the other evils that happen. Go back into that dark world and tell the people what I have done for you. Now remember who this guy was. What are the people going to think when they see this once crazy man now walking the streets of their own cities? And not only that, remember the people of Decapolis, what kind of people they are, as sinful as they are. He's about to go into their communities, into their neighborhoods to tell them what Jesus had done. He had no training in theology, no training in ministry. He didn't even have a Bible in his hand. All he had was a changed life. <laughs> All he had was his testimony and the command of Jesus to go and to tell the people what he had done for this man. In Mark chapter 5, verse 20, the last verse of our story says, And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. Wow. You know, I wish, I wish one of the disciples stayed behind with this man so that they could record all the words that he spoke to the people. I wish somehow we knew the details of what he said, who he talked to, and what that was like. I wish we could see the words, and listen, and read the words that he spoke to the people of Decapolis. What do you think the disciples thought of this trip to the other side? How did they see all of this? Do you think that they thought it was a waste of time? I mean, yes, Jesus healed one man, one horribly sick man, completely healed and made brand new by Jesus, and now sent off to proclaim the message to all the people. That's good. One man, that's great, but the people wanted us gone. They told us to get out. They don't want us to be here. They don't want to hear what Jesus has to say. And so here we are back in the boat, going back to where we came from. I wonder if they would have looked at this whole story as being a waste of time, something that didn't quite work out as Jesus perhaps had hoped it would be. You know, a lot of times I've, I've talked to many people who have gone to the other side, spoken to people, and it might be a, a fearful thing. It, it might be something they, they never thought they would have the courage to do, but they do it. They tell people about Jesus. And I've talked to a lot of people who say, you know, I, I talked to this person finally. My father, my brother, my friend, my boss. I finally talked to them about Jesus, but they didn't care. They, re they rejected it. They made fun of me. They ridiculed me. And so I guess it was a waste of time. But I have tried to encourage so many Christians don't ever judge the results of your meeting with somebody. Don't ever judge the results by what you see immediately. Because the results may come sometime later. Our job is to plant seeds, 
to plant the seed of the gospel. That's our job. That's, that's our work in the ministry of Jesus. We are to go out, find people, and plant the seeds of the gospel of salvation. The rest of it is up to the Holy Spirit to bring fruit into that person's life and to bring them into faith in Jesus Christ. But you never know. Those people that you have talked to in the past and maybe nothing happened, you never know what the Holy Spirit may be doing even today in that person's life. I believe sometimes you may talk to someone and it, it doesn't really resonate with them. They don't really seem to care. But the Holy Spirit knows next year that same person is going to, going to go through a very difficult thing like many people are going through today. And in their moment of desperation, they will remember what you said and they will call upon the one that you told them about, Jesus. So I want to encourage all of you, don't ever look at something as being a waste of time. It was a waste to tell that person about Jesus or to go to those people. Don't ever think that. Plant the seeds of the gospel and then pray that the Lord of the harvest will do the work of saving people. We don't know what this man said to the people of Decapolis. But the Holy Spirit did make sure we see the results of his testimony. We do know something about Decapolis after he went and proclaimed the message of Jesus. The Holy Spirit gives us the end of the story. And it's found in the Gospel of Matthew. It says that Jesus went back again to the same region of the Decapolis. He skirted the Sea of Galilee, went into the Decapolis again. His disciples were with him. And maybe they were thinking, oh boy, here we go again, back to that same place. And maybe they're thinking once again, Jesus, we were, we've already been there. Remember what happened? Yes, you healed one man, but they didn't want us there. They kicked us out. They were afraid. They told you to get out. And we did. Why are we going back there again? Well, they're about to see why. Look with me at Matthew chapter 15. This story is the next time Jesus goes back into that place called the other side, the Decapolis. Matthew chapter 15, verse 29 to 31. Jesus departed from there skirted the Sea of Galilee and went up on the mountain and sat down there. That is the Decapolis. Then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, the blind, mute, maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking and the maimed made whole, the lame walking and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Amen. They glorified the God of Israel in contrast to the God of the Baals, the God of Zeus, the God of the Greeks, the gods of the Canaanites. No, now those same people are glorifying the God of Israel, the one true God and Savior of the world. How did all this happen? When Jesus went back to that land, how did they know him? How did they know that they could bring all the sick to him, that he would heal them, that he would change lives? How did they know that? Well, my friends, to me, the only option is it was the result of one man, the Gadarene, who was healed of demonic possession. Jesus told him, go back home and tell them what I have done for you. And this man, faithful to the call, he went and did just that. And the end result was Jesus healing the multitudes of people in the Decapolis. And they glorified the one true God and Savior of the world. Praise God. What a wonderful ending to this story. And what a wonderful wake-up call. It was to the disciples and it is to us that we must also go to our other side and to proclaim the gospel to whomever, no matter who it is, no matter what condition they are in, we are told to go and to proclaim. So
So where is your other side? Is it your family, your community? Maybe it is another country, wherever God is calling you to. But we are, go, we are to go to the other side. We are to remember that the Lord is always with us. When we go and do the work of the Lord, He is there among us. He paves the way for us. He's there with us. And I believe He will use our words and our ministry, our testimony to save the lost. That's exactly why we do this. So that the Lord Jesus can touch the lost and to save them and to set them free just like he did for the Gadarene, just like he did for you and me. Now it's time, my friends. We must go out and proclaim this message. And I believe that today, people need to hear it more than ever before. Let us be faithful to the call and go to the other side. Let's all pray together. Lord God, first I thank you for what you did for this Gadarene man. A man who was so horribly possessed, a man who suffered, a man who was insane, a man really tortured by the demons inside, and yet upon meeting you, you set him free, you changed his life, you saved him. God, thank you for what you did for him, and thank you, Lord, that you can still work such power in our lives as well, and to those that we want to speak to, to those in our family or our friends. Whoever it is that we feel you're, you're tugging at our heart, your gentle nudge for us to go and speak to this person or that person, help us to know that your power can also set them free and save them as well. Lord, I pray, teach us to go to the other side, wherever that might be, to whomever that might involve. And I pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to fill us with power to give us wisdom, to help us to speak. And I pray, Lord, that we will do as this man did, just simply proclaim what the Lord has done. And I pray, Lord, that our communities, our families, our cities, our nations, they will be changed by Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for the things that we have learned today, once again, from this Portraits series. And I pray, God, set our eyes upon the harvest and help us to see it as you do. It is ready. It is ready to be gathered. So send us out into the fields. You go with us, Lord, as the Lord of the harvest. Send us out so that we may seek and save that which was lost. Praise the Lord. We give you all thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us once again. And as we end today's sermon, I just pray that God will uh, bless you, that he will keep you, He'll keep his good hand upon your life, that he will give you grace and peace and mercy, and that he will also put in your heart those people in your life that need to be saved, that he will uh, draw that out of you with, with such a desire to want to tell them about Jesus. And I pray that as you go, the Lord will be with you. The Lord will speak through you, and you will see people one to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, and until next time uh, for our uh, portrait series, until then, may he be with you. I'll see you again. Amen.